Hello, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you very much, uh, first of all, to uh, Pastor John and his wife, Joanna, and Christian Voice Ireland uh, for the opportunity for us to speak here today. We greatly appreciate it. Um, as John said, I'm Pader Tobin, my name, the leader of AIN2, which is a new all-Ireland political movement that's growing around the country at the moment. We're only four years old. Um, the reason that we were formed is because no other political organization or movement would champion that the values uh, that we hold very dear to us. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we're growing so strongly around the country at the moment. And one of the key issues... <clears throat> One of the key issues uh, for AIN2 is the idea of the competition of ideas. So we believe very much in the democratic process. And we believe that for a democracy to function, ideas need to be allowed to compete. And for ideas to be allowed to compete, people need, be, need to be able to talk openly and robustly and respectfully uh, as well. And in a functioning democracy, when that happens, the ideas that are the better ideas, they percolate up into the policy of the country and become the policy of the country uh, in that state. But the problem is that we are entering a time in Ireland, unfortunately, a very authoritarian time, I believe, where certain views are being censored. And as a result, we don't have that fair, open competition of ideas. And that's a big difficulty currently. People are afraid to stand up and say very obvious things, very normal things, uh, you know, with, 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 with uh, any, any of these very uh, sensitive issues, and that's wrong. So, first of all, people should be able to speak fairly, openly and respectfully on these very important uh, topics. The other issue, we, we, we do believe that um, you know, it's not just citizens that have that problem, TDs have their problems as well. And I remember sitting in a, a studio with a minister You'd expect a minister to be a hardened, you know, battle-hardened individual, able to discuss robust issues with anybody. Um, and I asked him, you know, what did he think of these ideas? At the time, there was a situation where Graeme Linehan of Father Ted History was uh, debating these issues in prime time um, in RTE. And Labour youth were outside with their placards saying that he had no right to speak on this important issue. And all he wanted to say was the sentence that a woman is a female adult. Uh, and yet he was being you know, protested by a political party against that. And I asked the minister who was in the studio with me, wasn't that wrong? And he agreed with me that that was absolutely wrong. And I said, well, why don't you say something about it? And he says, because you'd have the head taken off you by the media if you spoke in relation to that. And that just shows you that even up at the top end, so-called of this democracy, people are fearful of speaking uh, on these issues. Uh, and that's incredibly wrong. The second issue is that we're a, a, a pluralist Republican political party. So we do believe that there are many different types of value systems in Ireland. Everybody is equal, no matter what their identity, their ethnicity, their religion, their orientation is, and everybody should be treated on the basis of their own character, first and foremost. And we do understand as well that gender dysphoria is not easy for anybody. It is a very, very difficult issue for a person to deal with, um, and we should deal with people with gender dysphoria with compassion. Um, but it's also important to know that the, the limits to someone's rights is where they start to infringe on somebody else's rights. So, and that's the key question that's been missed in politics. That's the key question that's been missed in politics. And in education, the first right is the right of the child to be protected. That's the first critical right in education. <laughs> education should be on the basis of science, it should be on the basis of facts, and it can be framed by the ethos of the parents who are sending their children there. The, the, the other issue about education is the Department of Education is employed by the parents to teach the children. That's really important. And that seems to be missing from a lot of the debate that's happening at the moment. Uh, and parents must consent in terms of education. You know, I believe very strongly the parents should be able to choose the value system of the school within reason to be able to send their kids to that school. And if you separate parents from the, the material that children are being taught in class, well, that's a, a pathway to massive danger in terms of parents' rights and children's rights uh, as well. So, 
You know, back in the, in the past, we're told that the 1950s and 60s, we had a very uniform education system. There was one type of education system. You had to accept it or get stuffed. Uh, and then we moved on to what was called a pluralist education system, where there were plural values, and people were able to select a school that reflected uh, their children's uh, uh, values. But now, unfortunately, we seem to be going back to the idea of uniformity. You must accept one value system, and that value system is the govern government's value system, and your value system can go and get stuffed as far as the government is concerned at the moment. Now, it's also important that, to see that this government is radically out of step with most people on this issue. Now, when you actually look at the news or you consume the media, most media, that is, with the honourable exception probably of Gript uh, and a couple of others, the truth of the matter is you would feel that nearly your voice is a minority voice, but in actual fact, most polling that's been done is shown that the majority of parents think it's wrong that children in primary school are being taught about transgenderism. The majority of parents believe that they should have a right to choose the ethos uh, of the school uh, that they're sending their kids to. And the government have become super ideological on this issue. And it's not just me that's saying this. You know, we even have leading doctors in the National Gender Services uh, in Ireland, and these are doctors who are like, probably the most educated people on this issue in the country, and they're also probably the most invested in the issue of, of gender dysphoria of people in this country too, because they're working with people with gender dysphoria every single day. And Professor Donal O'Shea stated at an Oireachtas committee, and these are his words, he said, the governments are being brainwashed by activist organizations, and the HSC is being brainwashed by activist organizations as well. So this process is not just starting now. It started a number of years ago, and you know, evidence of this has been very clear. I know of, uh, teachers who have gone to uh, in-service days in secondary schools, and they've been told you know, and in those in-service days that they shouldn't use the words mother or father because those words were not considered uh, inclusive enough. The NCCA uh, was also on their website, had links to uh, different other websites which basically said that teachers shouldn't uh, try to catch the attention of children with the words boys and girls either because that was considered non-inclusive uh, uh, as well. And now we have the situation where we're heading towards September and there is a junior cert certificate, SPHE uh, curriculum in place and that teaches that gender identity is a person's felt internal and individual uh, experience. And you know, the fact that that's been taught as a fact is a major difficulty. I wouldn't mind if someone taught that and said, some people feel that this is the case, but the fact that it's been taught as a fact means it's a significant threat in relation to fact and science-based uh, education uh, in our country. Um, you know, just the, the whole process that the governments took in identifying the curriculum was incredible. The NCCA carried out a significant, they said, consultation with parents. Thousands of parents contacted the NCCA and literally, in a, in a side note, in their draft um, curriculum, they stated that you know, some parents en masse you know, uh, uh, were opposed to the, this direction in terms of gender ideology. And you know, what's the point of having a consultation process at all if you're going to simply get the consultation of thousands of parents and wrap it up into a big paper ball and throw it into the waste paper basket, because that's exactly what they did uh, in this situation. I also want to say that the government have said, well, there'll be opt-outs. So in other words, that a child can be withdrawn from the classes uh, in relation to this. That is not a solution. The government needs to hear that loud and clear. It is simply not good enough to accept that we're going to other thousands of children, exclude thousands of children from class in, in all the peer pressure and difficulties that that will cause for those children, simply because we as parents don't want to send our kids to those classes. You know, the government can not tell us that that is an acceptable solution at all, and we will continue to fight that issue. And I just want to say as well that this is not an isolated political objective by the government in relation to education. This fits 
neatly into the whole plan the government has in relation to the rest of society. And this became brutally evident a little while ago when the government tried to get rid of the word mother from maternity legislation. Now, it's just, you know, people were scratching their heads to, to wonder how far we've traveled from common sense in terms of that issue. You know, the HSC advertised, you know, for people with a cervix in relation to cervical check instead of advertising to women. Now, that was extremely dangerous in my view because, you know, cervical cancer is a killer. It's a serious illness. And you cannot be confused in relation to the message that you aim to communicate around cervical cancer. And the idea that they were pitching their messaging on the basis of a person with a cervix is absolutely uh, incredible as well. And we've seen you know, other situations where chest feeding has been used by the HSE instead of breastfeeding as well. Even the, the government, the government, the Taoiseach himself is arguing against the Irish Rugby Union's decision to have female-only participants play in women's rugby. So in other words, to have no male-born uh, uh, athletes play in women's rugby. Now, the reason Irish rugby made that decision was because a male-born player typically, on average, has a bigger physique, a heavier physique, bigger muscle mass, bigger lungs, etc., is likely to be more competitive in terms of the sport, but definitely in terms of impact, more dangerous if a person comes into an impact in relation to this. Now, the other issue that I want to say is at the heart of the government's um, uh, education system currently is the idea of gender affirmation. And gender affirmation is, is potentially very, very dangerous because some people experience gender dysphoria for a number of different reasons. It may be because of mental health issues, it may be because of autism or other comorbidities that might exist. But if you just affirm a person's desired uh, gender and do not actually try to find solutions to the causes of that dysphoria, you're going to change that person's gender without actually treating the causes, which means the person will have changed gender in the eyes of the law, but will still have the illnesses that were at the heart of that. So that person won't be treated. And the idea of going to a doctor and telling the doctor what exactly you have, and the doctor, you should carry out this type of um, uh, treatment for me, is absolutely wrong. Doctors and psychiatrists and psychologists want to be able to explore all the reasons why a person might be feeling a certain way and explore all the potential treatments that might resolve uh, that particular uh, issue uh, as well. Now, I've asked the Taoiseach in, from the floor of the doll what impact assessment have they made in terms of children when it comes to the education uh, that they uh, expect to be delivering come September. And the Taoiseach has admitted to me that no impact assessment has been made whatsoever uh, in terms of this. And I think that's extremely dangerous. And I'll tell you why. Because already 82,000 children a year are being uh, referred to Tusla. Already we have a, a, a significant problem with suicidality amongst young adults, uh, etc. when you compare it with older adults. Uh, already we have major difficulties uh, in terms of uh, child, uh, uh, ch child access to pornography. And I've only got a couple of minutes, but I want to speak very briefly on that issue uh, as well. We know that a lot of children are consuming pornography on the internet uh, at the moment. Uh, we know that that's ex extremely dangerous. It's uh, dangerous in terms of uh, addiction. It's dangerous for girls in terms of the expectation that that material creates for them. But it's also extremely dangerous because most of this content is highly violent and highly aggressive. And it's leading to sexual violence within our society at an enormous rate. So incidents of rape, incidents of sexual assault are doubling on a 10 yearly basis at the moment. Child on child sexual assault is increasing at a rate of 40% at the moment within the states. And yet this government wants in the new uh, junior circle, uh, junior uh, cert, um, uh, curriculum to teach children about pornography. Now, I don't mind if they teach children about the dangers of pornography and the dangers uh, in relation to sexual violence uh, as well that could come from that. But the problem is within the education system, within academia in this country, there is a section of society that believes that you can have benign pornography for children. So in other words, that pornography can be a normal and positive experience within young children's lives. Now, I'm talking to parents who, you know, when they take the laptop off the kids, they tell me at Christmas time that their 10-year-old children are looking at you know, search engine Santa Claus and the next search engine they're looking at hardcore pornography. And I'm thinking, how can any education system 
try to teach to children that this is a, a normal uh, behavior for them. Um, and, you know, it's, it, I've listened to people who've contributed to the NCCA curriculum development states that one of the studying materials possibly for um, pornography could be a script of a pornographic film that the children in the class might go through as they study uh, what pornography is all about. And I'm thinking that so many parents are doing their best, their damnedest, to prevent their kids accessing this material, and now they want us to send their children to a school to consume that material at the same time. It just doesn't make sense uh, whatsoever. Um, there's, there's so much in, in relation to this around um, the outcomes of this type of education in general society, around women's safe spaces when it comes to, to bathrooms, when it comes to changing rooms. Obviously, we mentioned sports, but just to say that we in Aintu produced a bill that would, for the first time, amend the Gender Recognition Act. And if people remember, the Gender Recognition Act gave people, anybody, the rights to change uh, gender for whatever reason uh, they wanted to. It provided no gatekeeper, no doctor, no psychiatrist, and uh, no psychologist would try to find out whether this person was for real or whether this person was an opportunist in relation to it. Now we have this incredible situation where we have a male-born sex offender in a women's prison in Limerick. Uh, people may have heard of Barbie Kardashian. I'd say if you've heard of it, you've probably only heard of it in the likes of Gripped because most of the media are not actually uh, reporting on this at the moment. But this is a very disturbed uh, male who has threatened to to rape and murder his own mother, and now he's in a female prison. Now, the fact that we have to explain to the government of today how that does not make sense, the fact that we have to explain the idea of safe spaces for women that have been, you know, obvious to everybody for the last 200 years is just absolutely mind-blowing. But the government are so consumed currently ideologically that they have they have literally got rid of the whole idea of common sense. And that's why I believe that compassion and common sense have to be re-injected into the political system in Ireland. And that is our objective uh, to, to do that. Uh, we'll try to answer a number of the questions. I'm over time at the moment, but Gurav Mila Maho